Hey, do you have a problem reading MRIs? Do you get confused and lost when you see the words like T1, T2, DWI, weighted imaging on MRIs and have like a hardest time of your life answering the questions of your consultants and residents? You're at the right spot. My name is Dr. Yash Bowser and you're watching MedReader. Stay tuned where we discuss MRI in detail. So let's start by just comparing briefly what is MRI versus CT scan. Everyone knows CT scan. Um, CT scan is very good at mapping the tissue density where you're differentiating it between the bone and the soft tissue. It's very good at showing bright images of bone uh, all across the body. Well, MRI is a map of a proton energy in the tissues of the body where the white area is represented as high intensity signal or high attenuation signals. High density is a word for CT scan and high intensity is a word for MRI. We do MRI because CT scans are not so good at delineating the difference between uh, the soft tissue and the heart tissue. MRI does a better job at differentiating within the soft tissue of what is going on, even the vascular changes, even the little bit of an inflammatory changes and whatnot. CSF, for example, is a watery substance that covers our brain, is a low density on CT scan. Whereas you can see a high density as well as a low density of it on an MRI. So as something as less dense as watery structures are even appreciated better on the MRI. As you can see on this image that uh, a CT scan is showing the bone, which is the brightest at the borders. It's basically the skull. And the MRI is showing all the different soft tissue structures right even within the cell size at the gyri's. And more than that, CSF is visible. And different types of intensities really uh, make it look um, appreciable on the final images. And there are different versions and different, uh, you know, levels of sequences of how CSF appears within different types of MRIs, which we'll discuss in the forward slides. So this is a typical MRI machine. Um, we've all seen it at some point of our life in the hospitals, but um, there are several steps once you go inside an MRI machine, there are several steps that happen. MRI machine basically uses the fact that um, your body is consisting of H plus ions or the hydrogen ions also called as protons, which has plus one energy. Um, our body, when it's not in the MRI machine at rest, is consisting of these protons in an ambiguous and various different kind of positions. So the vectors of these H plus are at all over the places, they're not aligned. So what MRI machine does as a first step is it aligns these H pluses, then it manipulates these H plus directions into a specific position. And how does it do it? It does it by uh, applying radio frequency pulsations. So step one, you go inside an MRI machine, all the magnetic fields and the magnets start working and they align the edge pluses in every cell of your body. And after that alignment, it shocks you with that radio frequency wave. And then that radio frequency uh, waving is stopped. And then your protons of the body are realigning themselves. So when they're realigning themselves, there's an amount of energy that is being released which is captured by the MRI machine. Now this captured map of the energy is later transcribed into a very high definition image. Let me show you what I mean. So this is a very good description of what I was talking about uh, when I was uh, telling you about the proton uh, manipulation. The free protons in the body, you can, as you can see on the top left image, are completely random. The vectors are random. They are spinning in different directions. So when you're going in the machine, uh, the first thing that happens is a magnetic field is imposed on your body. And it aligns all the protons, as you can see on the top right image. Then what happens is 
after the every proton of your body is aligned, a radio frequency pulse is generated, which uh, manipulates the edge plus in a specific direction. Then those radio frequencies are stopped. And then what happens is your body's protons start realigning themselves at their own speed into the positions they were in. Now keep in mind that the lower right image as shown here is the time when your cells and the protons inside your cells will realign themselves and generate a specific amount of energy which is being recorded and then transcribed into a specific high definition image. So the different tissues in the body have different speed of realigning their protons uh, once the radio frequency impulse is generated in the MRI. Fat is known to reposition its protons the fastest. And so on T1 weighted images, you're gonna see higher appreciation of fat. And on T2 images, you're gonna see higher appreciation of fat and water. Because water is a little bit slower than fat at realigning itself. Let me tell you in detail what I mean. So in order to understand it in detail, you need to understand two concepts. Number one is TE, which is called echo time. This is the time interval in which signals are measured after RF or the radio frequency excitation happens. Um, and TR is the repetition time, the time between the two excitations that you induce by radio frequency waves. So in general, what happens is, uh, how can you differentiate in between T1 and T2? Logically is in general, a short TR, which is a short repetition time and a short um, echo time is evident in T1. T1 has both shorter time intervals in between shocking with radio frequency, as well as a shorter period of time, period of time in between actually uh, the cells realigning themselves. So longer TR and TE is for a T2 scan and scans like flare, DW, etc. And shorter TR or um, the shorter um, repetition time and the echo time is for um, T1 weighted images. This image is a very good description of what we were talking about the properties in general on T1 and T2. On the left, you can see um, a sagittal section of a part of the spine where you can appreciate all the whites and the grays. So in the vertebral bodies, you can appreciate the whitenesses because of the bone marrow. And right around the corners and the edges of the spine and interspinous processes, you can appreciate whiteness, which is fat. In fact, on the, the most right side of uh, the left image is a subcutaneous fat layer, which is really bright white. But what's the difference in between the two image is an extra portion of the white, which is shown on the right image, which is a T2 weighted image, it shows CSF, but it also shows all the fat structures, which are white. So T1 weighted image is very good at um, delineating the fat structures and T2 image is very good at delineating the fat as well as the watery structures. In this case, um, as you can appreciate the CSF even better. So once again, really fast, the fat tissue is appreciable on both T1 and T2, but it's just the watery substances like CSF, inflammation, and vasogenic edema, even in, you know, infarction-related edema, everything that's watery, um, inflammatory, is going to appear much brighter on the T2 scan. And that's why we need to compare the T1 from T2 oftentimes in order to um, differentiate in between an inflammatory or watery pathologies. So this is in general a very good image in order to describe the differences in between T1, T2 and flare based images or MRI sequences. What you can appreciate on the T1 based image here is look, notice how fat and the white matter 
is white on the T1. Um, the rim around the brain, the white rim around the brain that you can see is the bone marrow fat of the skull. And the other less wider structures inside the brain that you can see are all the white matters. Because white matter of the brain is consisting of myelin, which is made up of fat and proteins. Notice how the CSF in the T1 weighted image is appearing dark. Because remember, water on T1 is not so much appreciated. Look at the T2 weighted image. The CSF is bright white because that's the characteristic of T2 weighted images. The inflammation and the watery based structures, they appear very bright white on the T2 based um, MRI sequence. And the white matter is gray on the T2. So when you compare T1 and T2, it's almost like you're pushing that contrast button as you push it on your iPhone sometimes. It's just like that. It's, it's just like a reverse contrast that you can appreciate. So when you compare these two images, you're better able to understand which portions are inflammatory, infection focused, maybe an abscess, maybe a vasogenic edema, maybe a post um, ischemic stroke kind of an edema. Everything that's watery and everything that's squishy is going to appear white on the T2 or whiter on the T2 than T1. And you can also um, remove certain confusions that you, you might see certain abnormalities on the T1, but if they are not appearing whiter on the T2, um, it's, it, it might not necessarily be an inflammation or the pathology that you were thinking of. So it's very useful to compare T1 and T2. The flare image in this um, uh, diagram, we're going to keep it for later. I just want to focus that um, focus the fact that you can see that the CSF on the flare and the other tissues are in general dimmed out. They're in general more blacker and grayer than the T1 and T2. Why? We're going to discuss in the forward images. So just like we saw these sections of brain MRI, here's the sagittal section of the spine. Again, what we can appreciate is on the T2 weighted image, right around the spinal cord, if you can appreciate, the T2 weighted image is showing bright white CSF. Notice how the discs in between the vertebral bodies are having a little bit of a brighter white than the T1. It's basically because of the nucleus pulposus. Again, watery, protein-rich substances present inside um, is going to make it white. Also notice that um, similar way as in the similar way as we saw in the MRI images, the inflammatory substances or the inflammatory exudates like edema, infarction-related problems, and demyelination is going to appear very bright on the T2 weighted images. Now let's talk a little bit about the FLARE MRI sequences. FLARE stands for Fluid Attenuated Inversion Recovery. It's a very hard to explain what the terminology means and you, need, you don't need to understand the terminology. Just understand the mechanics. So what's going on? With T2 images, there is a limitation oftentimes. Um, just because the fluidic portions are appearing very uh, white around the CSF structures right at the interface of where the CSF ends and the normal soft tissue starts in the brain. Um, sometimes you can miss pathologies which are periventricular or, mm, you know, right around the periphery of the CSF structures. So as you can see here, the T2 images um, of a section of the brain is showing bright white ventricle, lateral ventricles and even the third ventricle and the CSF right around the sulci. You can appreciate all the whites in the T2 image. Um, but there is also a spot if you can appreciate right at the right besides the lateral ventricle, there's a small dot. That's a that's a possible pathology. Now, how would you differentiate or you know, really specifically know that it's even a pathology. You use flare-based image. When you use flare-based image, you're basically tuning down the hyperintensities of the CSF while maintaining the T1, T2 properties. So in other words, 
you are unmasking the pathologies buried within the whiteness of the CSF. In this case, this is a demyelination for patients, uh, for a patient who is diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. So it's really important to understand which section or sequence of MRI is used in which pathologies. And when you compare the differences between each and every sections and slides of MRIs, it's only then when you can really come up with a pathology. So at this point, I just want to discuss that all the previous MRI slides that we discussed were non-contrast based. We were still able to extract so much detail without using contrast about the pathologies, but we can also use contrast in MRI in order to delineate structures like tumors, um, abscesses, inflammatory infiltrates, and even um, disruptions in between the blood-brain barrier and the tissues. Like, it, like, for example, in this image, you can see the left one is a pre-gadolinium scan for the patient. And right after introducing gadolinium, a mass can be seen right around an unknown kind of a structure, hypodense structure that's on the left side. So this is really useful um, in terms of um, extracting um, pathologies that lie at the interface and between um, the uh, blood-brain barrier and the tissues of the brain. So this is really important to notice. So finally, I want to discuss about diffusion-weighted MRI, which is different from T1, T2, and FLARE. And it's a commonly used MRI for a very specific problem, and that's is acute ischemic stroke. The logic behind this kind of MRI sequence is uh, based on how stationary is water at a specific site, which we want to appreciate. So in general, what happens in cases of acute stroke is once you have an, uh, an abruptly obstructed artery inside um, the brain, the tissue right surrounding right around that obstructed vessel undergoes something called cytotoxic edema. It's basically because the sodium potassium channels are dying out of the ischemia and the water, uh, the, the sodium cannot escape outside. So the sodium stays inside the cell and it drags all the water inside it. So um, the edema, the cytotoxic edema that ensues after this kind of an acute stroke can be very well appreciated by diffusion-weighted MRI sequences. Why? Because the diffusion-weighted imaging is working on the principle where the hyper intensities on diffusion-weighted MRI are basically a stationary, non-moving, trapped kind of a water or an inflammatory infiltrate, if you want to say it like that. So stationary water molecules are unaffected by the paired gradients and thus they retain their signals, while non-stationary water is not so much appreciated on the DWI. So I want you to pause the video at this moment to appreciate uh, the text that is written here because it really explains how the DWI really works. Also, because of that stationary water property, not just it, it not just helps in the acute stroke condition, but uh, it also helps in conditions like brain abscess, acute acute demyelination, um, tumors with higher nuclear to cytoplasmic ratios, Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, and whatnot. So pause this video and just read through all the other um, pathologies that DWI helps to diagnose. So this is a very good um, slide that depicts a brain infarct, as you can appreciate on the left side of the image. There's a dwi weighted image of the brain, which shows a very white hyperintensity on one side and small dots uh, shown by the arrowheads, which shows pinpoint kind of an infarct going on right around the brain tissues. So. Remember one thing, DWI is very good at um, determining or, you know, showcasing acute stroke situations because it is very good at 
noticing the trapped water, which is a core sign of acute strokes, ischemic strokes. Now this image is a good comparison of a diffusion weighted image and a flare in a patient who might have encountered an ischemic stroke. So as you can see, even on the flare image, even if you can appreciate the flare image as having very high definition than the diffusion weighted image, it misses these um, water trapped areas because it is time sensitive. You know, acute stroke uh, comes up very fast and you have little time in order to diagnose this condition. So using flare images might not be a great idea um, rather than using a DWI. So DWI is designed to recognize these immediate localizations of water trapped around um, the ischemic uh, portions where the arteries are blocked. So another good example of knowing which sequence to use in which kind of pathology. So in general, always remember to have an understanding of what clinical question you have for the patient in order to decide which MRI sequence will the patient need. As an example here, you can see the patient one with gradually worsening headaches and seizures was diagnosed with a brain tumor. And the patient two had a sudden onset of a left hemiplegia and was diagnosed as having an acute cerebral infarct. Sometimes it might look, the MRI images might look the same, but the pathologies might be really different. So it's really, really important to understand the pathology and order a specific kind of an MRI slide or to look at the specific kind of an MRI slide um, after having a specific clinical question in mind. To sum up, in order to understand the pathology that we discussed in the prior images, don't forget to compare all these pathologies in different planes. So you have an axial plane which goes like you almost cut a tomato, then you have a sagittal plane where you cut your body from in between so that you have a left half and a right half, and there's a coronal plane which goes right horizontally right um, uh, through your body, separating the interior and posterior part of your body. So it's important to look at the different planes to compare the same pathologic focus and view it from different angles in order to get a bigger picture. So thank you so much if you were able to make until the end of this video. Like and share this video with your friends who might benefit from this video in order to understand the MRIs a little bit better. It motivates us to make videos for you in the future. Stay tuned.